Cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, how are we all doing? Can you let me know in the chat box that you can hear me all right? If you could type in here, that would be fantastic. Cool. Right. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Nick Craggs, as it says there. I'm AT Distance Learning Director at First Intuition, which means I don't do anything other than AT and distance learning. So I'm going to be your host for the next um, half an hour. We're going to look at uh, booking transactions and bookkeeping controls. So before we get started, has anyone got an exam coming up soon? Is everyone stream transactions or controls or looking for a bit of revision for uh, Foundation Synoptic? Yeah. Ah, cool. Megan's <laughs> level four PDSY. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Right. So the plan is we're going to look at uh, bank reconciliations um, from booking controls. I'm going to do that first because I like it and it's bigger. And mm -hmm. look at discounts from bookkeeping transactions. Bank recs, really, really important. Cannot stress that uh, enough. So in the real world, when you do prepare a set of accounts, you have to get the bank to reconcile. Because if the bank doesn't reconcile, you can't be sure that you've got all the transactions or you've got transactions in that shouldn't be missing. So when we prepare a um, set of accounts, we would reconcile the bank in our working papers and then from that point then, we would work outwards. Until the bank's reconciled, you can't do anything. The bank must reconcile. It's really important, people do it all day, every day. Um, but as systems move on, it is get, becoming automated and with the open banking system and whatnot, um, things like zero and whatnot are making bank reconciliations relatively obsolete, but it's still a massive job. I've spent many, many days ticking off cash books um, in my job well, previous job, I should say, really important. Cool, right, good luck for everyone sitting exams. You know, Rachel, good luck for Thursday. Um, let's get cracking. So, can you all see my screen? Okay. Yes. Brilliant. Right, so what we have here is we've got an example. This is actually two tasks we're going to do from the bookkeeping controls exam. So one is updating the cash book and one is the actual um, reconciliation. You will have to do both. And you have to do both in, in real life. Um, so it, it is the sort of thing that you, you, will, you will have to do in the exam. It's not a case of it might come up or whatnot. It will definitely come up, I promise you. So what we're doing is we're going to look at things that are, we're going to look at the bank statement and we're going to compare it to the cash book. And there's stuff on the bank statement that needs to be in the cash book. There's stuff on the bank statement that isn't in the cash book, and but doesn't need to be. Um, and we're going to look at how we deal with them. Cool. So before you start any bank reconciliation question, you need to look at the opening balance on the bank statement and the opening balance on the cash book. So you see here, we've got an opening balance of £2,500. Now it's on the credit side. So what does that mean? Is the business overdrawn or has it got money in the bank account? Yeah, overdrawn. That's right. So because it's a credit, it's a liability. So from that point of view, the business owes money to the bank. Now, when we look at the bank statement, it's got D for debit. And you think, well, debit's an asset in the accounting world. But if you're thinking it from the bank's point of view, when you owe money to the bank because you're overdrawn from the bank's point of view that's a good thing you're an asset to them so debit means you are an asset to the bank because you owe the money whereas if you like you i've just got paid nice get in um you just got paid i'm actually in credit because what that means is the bank owes me money which is a situation we want to be in and um, so for this point here it's a debit so that means that the bank uh, so the person is overdrawn. But you can see here, the bank, the cash book has a, a credit of £2,500, whereas the bank statement only has a, um, a figure of £2,400. So what we've got here is an opening unpresented item. So what that means is it's something that was in last month's cash book, which meant the last month's cash book closing figure was £2,500 but it hadn't gone through the bankers yet. And this will be due to a timing difference. And the most common ones of these are checks, because you think of a check, you write a check out, 
put it in the post. Or if you're really, really bad like me, you write a check out and it sits on your desk for like weeks. So you don't like go to the post office. And then it goes to the post office. Then it gets there. Then you've got to go and get it to the post has got to deliver it and then you've got to open it then you've got to put it in the bank and then the bank's got to clear so there's a, quite a time difference so when you say the money has gone through your cash book and when it physically goes out of your bank account so can anyone spot the check that might be causing the difference which check do you think is the opening unpresented item you've got a choice of <laughs> Check number one. That's right. So in 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 reality, there could be loads, and it could be very very tricky identifying what the opening unpresented items are. Which is why, when you do a set of accounts, the first thing you do is look at last year's bank reconciliation, so you can identify them. Because as soon as you get a combination of more than two or three items, they all balance off each other, and it's a nightmare trying to unpick what it is. Now, in your exam. It'll only be one transaction and it will always almost, well, it will always be right at the start of the month. So it's relatively easy to spot. So the check number one of a hundred pound must be the opening unpresented item. So we can now see if we take that into account that the bank uh, effective bank balance is two and a half thousand pounds. So what that means is being an unpresented item is it was recorded in last month's cash book. Therefore, we don't want to update it in this month's cash book because it's already in the accounts. So although it's on this month's bank statement, it was in last month's cash book. So we don't need to put it on because it's already in the accounts. Is everyone okay with that? Yes. Cool. So now, we've identified our opening unpresented item. Once you've done that, you can move on. Until you've done that, you can't move on because you don't know whether it's something that's on the bank statement that needs to be in the cash book or it's something that's on the bank statement that doesn't need to be in the cash book because we in last month's cash book. So once you've identified it, like we have here, we can ignore it. And then we can start doing what I call ticking off the bank statements. So what we would need to do is look for things that are on the bank statement but also in the cash book. So you can see you've got uh, check number two for 200 pounds. So that, well, we'll get a different color uh, so we can highlight these. So that goes up there. So we just, this is what I used to do on a, for a living is analysis pad to get the bank statement and you get your records and you tick it off on the bank statement, tick it off in your cash book and you know they match. So you can see here, you've got check number five, check number five. Then you've got check number four, got check number four. Now we've come to this back transfer from Hound Limited. Now, this is in our bank statement, but it's not in our cash book. Now, we've already identified the opening unpresented item, so it can't be that. Therefore, what this must be is, is something that we haven't entered into our accounting records as yet. And it typically is backs things like this, because sometimes people will pay you and send you remittance advice. That's a bit of paper that says, I have paid you. Sometimes they'll just pay you and you won't know. It just appears in your bank statement. So until you see it on the bank statement, you don't know you've been paid. So you need to update your records. So this is a receipt we've had from Hound Limited that's coming to our bank account. We need to update our cash book. So we're gonna put it in here on the 14th of June, come from Hound. Don't worry, in the real exam, you will get drop-down boxes. You won't have to type it out or write it out like as I am. And we're going to update our cash book for that because we need to show the fact that Hound Limited have paid us this amount. And that means we've got more money in the bank account, obviously, but it also means we won't be, I was going to make a joke there, but we won't be hounding uh, Hound Limited for the money when they, um, they don't, don't, don't owe it anymore. So we've updated the cash book. Is everyone clear why I've updated the cash book for the check of Hound, but not for the check number one? Yeah. Cool. So what? now we've updated it, we can actually tick it off because we know it's there. So tick off that. And we can tick off that. Now we've got check number six. Check number six. That's there. That's there. What else have we got? We've got the direct debit free electric. Yep, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And we've got... The rent, we must know that goes out every month, £350. 
And now we, oh, and then the last one, we've got bank charges. Now, bank charges, very similar to like the bank's payment, is the banks, banks don't like sending out letters nowadays. They do anything to avoid spending any money. And it's good, bad for the environment as well. So everything's gone paperless. So you probably don't see that the bank have charged you until they charge you. And so you need to update your records because you have got £50 less. So what we'll do, we'll update our records for the fact we paid £50 in charges. £50. And then whilst, whilst we're here, we haven't seen the overdraft fee until um, this point. It needs to go in our account. So we've got the overdraft fee and that was £150. So we can then match them off because we've now updated records. And the last one is paid in at middle bank, £2,000, £2,000. So now we can be sure we haven't missed any transactions. So if there was something on the bank statement that's not an unpresented item, but not in the cash book, we need to update our cash book because in the world of, uh, well, in reality, banks don't make errors. If it's gone out the bank, it's gone out the bank. So if it's gone out the bank and it's not an unpresented item, we physically spent that money. So we have to update our cash book because the cash book must reflect what we owe um, or don't owe the bank. So is everyone okay up to so, so far? We've now updated the cash book for every transaction that needs to be in there. We've, we can be sure there's nothing missing. So now we're nearly there. What we need to do is we need to calculate the closing balance. We need to balance our cash book off. So we can look at which server side is the biggest and clearly the debit side is the biggest. Uh, we've got all these receipts for thousands of pounds. So what we can do is put the total there, it's gonna be, I can do this in my head actually, two plus three plus four plus one is 10,000. 10, 10,000, that's right, 10,000 pounds. And then the op op opposite side is going to have to balance off. So what we'll do is get the larger side, which is 10,000, and take off all these transactions. So if you get 10,000, I've already done this to save a bit of time, but if you get 10,000, take off two and a half thousand pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, it comes to, it leaves you a balance of 4,700 pounds. So the balance carried down is 4,700 pounds. Remember the balance carried down is the closing balance. So that is the balance you carry forward into the pre into the following accounting period whereas balance brought down the one at the top is the opening because you bring it down from the previous period so you can see that this uh, balances off at ten thousand pounds which it does if you add it up um and then the balance brought down and the next period is not ten thousand pounds it is four thousand seven hundred pounds so if they've got a balance brought down on the debit side, is there money in the bank account or is it overdrawn? Um, overdrawn? Right. Um, that's right, Megan. Um, so previously, if it was on the credit side of the cash book, it was overdrawn. Whereas now it's on the debit side, it's an asset. So you've got money yeah. in Whereas the closing balance goes on the opposite side of what it is. So it got, although it goes at the closing balance, the balance carried down goes on the credit side, it means there's actually money in there. It is an asset. So it's the opening balance goes on the side as to what something is. So in this case, it's a debit, therefore it's an asset. Whereas the balance carried down goes on the other side. So is everyone okay to there? That's the point where we've updated our cash book and now we can look to move on and do our bank reconciliation. So what we've got here is the previous example. It's just the bank, uh, the cash book has been updated um, for us, so we don't need to do it. So now we need to do our bank reconciliation, which is what, we, what we're doing here is saying that our accounting records match the bank statement. And if that's the case, we can show yeah, our accounting record. Yeah. However... We'll have to do some adjustments because not everything will tie up due to time differences. So once we make the adjustments, it will then tie up. So we've got the balance per bank statement, which is 
thousand pounds. But remember, it's a debit on the bank statement, which means from the bank's point of view, we're we're an asset to them. We owe them money. So it's gonna be two thousand pounds, but two thousand pounds overdrawn. Now we need to identify our unpresented items. So what we can do, we'll, we'll do it again, uh, but you could see it from the previous month, actually, is tick them off. So, for example, check one, we know is the opening unpresented item, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then we can just run off 200, 200, 500, 500, 400, 400, 1,000, 1,000, 600, 600. See what I'm doing here and quickly just do all them. And then 2,000. 2000. So now we've got some things in our cash book, which are in the cash book, but they're not on a bank statement and they're not um, uh, unpresented items. So that can only mean one thing. They are, um, well, if they're, if they're on the money inside, they're outstanding lodgements. We've got money that we are due to get in. Whereas if it's on the credit side, the payments, there are unpresented checks. So what we need to do is adjust uh, our bank balance for all the transactions that are yet to happen to it. Remember, the bank is slightly behind the times as regards the cash book. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the figure that the bank says we have, add on the receipts that are still to come in, because effectively we've got that money, and take out the payments that are yet to go out, because we're going to have to pay that, so we don't really have that money, and then it should come back to the £4,700 was our closing cash book figure. So you can see here we've got SIT Limited, um, which was £3,000. You can tell Gareth had just got himself a new dog when he wrote this. Uh, and we've got Heal PLC, an add-on uh, £4,000. So they've got £7,000 that is going to come into the bank account in the future. However, we have this check from spot or to spot limited. That is going to go out of the bank account. So we need to take that off because effectively we don't have that £300. So we're going to take off that. It takes off £300. So the total to subtract is 300, 300 not £3,000, uh, £300. So if you have a negative 2,000, you add 7,000 pounds on, you suddenly got effectively 5,000 pounds in your bank account. But if you've got 300 pounds gonna go out in the future, effectively your balance is 4,700 pounds, which balances the figure in our cash book. So we can be more than confident that our accounting records are correct because they marry up with the uh, bank statement. Has anyone got any questions on that? Because that's that's not the sort of thing that could come up in your exam in bookkeeping controls. That will come up in your exam. And actually, uh, I did see, I can't remember who it was. Uh, it also comes up at level three in advanced bookkeeping, a control account reconciliation of which a bank control is one. And it also comes up at level four when we look at uh, threshold synoptic and control account reconciliations and looking for errors in the uh, accounting systems and what would possibly cause or flag an error and what possibly wouldn't. Cool. So that's bookkeeper controls. That's, uh, it's like we're more, more than halfway through, but that's because it's a big thing. It will definitely, definitely be in your exam. So now we're going to look at uh, bookkeeping transactions. Um, so we're going to look at discounts. We answered we're going to cover discounts. Discounts uh, are quite tricky, and they are the sort of thing that students do struggle with initially. But I have a rule of thumb to help remember this. With discounts, you've got to remember who's in charge. So if you're selling something to someone, you don't have to give a discount if you don't want to. You just say, look, I'm, I'm not going to give you a discount. And they can buy it or they can not buy it, but at the end of the day, you're in control and you can say, Nope, I'm not going to allow you to have a discount. Whereas if you go to buy something, you can ask for a discount, but you can't forcibly get it. The person selling it can just say, nope, 
you're not on a discount. So discounts allowed are discounts that you are allowing your customers to have. Therefore, discounts allowed relate to sales. Whereas discounts that you receive are discounts that your suppliers are letting you have. Remember who has control. So if you receive discounts, that relates to your purchases. So I always think thinking about who has control about authorizing the discount helps to remember as to what the discount um, relates to. So let's have a look at some of these. So the first one is discounts received. True false questions here. Um, we've got it. Discounts received affect the sales ledger control account. Is that true or is that false? True. Anyone for anyone else? Now, if you think about it, discounts received. False. Ah, uh, yeah. Discounts received are what you receive from your suppliers. So when you get a discount, when you receive a discount, that's your supplier saying, I'll let you off this little bit. So normally you get a discount um, if you pay in a short period of time, like in a settlement discount. So that lets you off a bit that you owe, but that relates to the purchase ledger. So discounts received affecting sales ledger control account, that's actually false. Now, conversely, I think we all know the answer to this, discounts allowed is discounts you are allowing your customers to have. So this is us saying, I'll let you off a little bit of what you owe me if you pay me in good time or something or other. So it relates to customers and sales, therefore sales ledger control. It does affect that. And with any discounts, you've got two, two parts of it. One, which says, I've let my customers off a little bit of money that they owed me, so that's going to reduce revenue. And then the other half of that is also going to sales as control to say, I'm no longer owed this amount. So if you think about a transaction where someone owes you a thousand pounds, and then you say, actually, if you pay me by next week, I'll let you off a hundred pound. I go, fantastic. So what the, they'll do is they'll do a check for 900 pound, and you would debit the bank with 900 pound, because that is physically what you received. And as we've just seen, the bank must balance. So you debit the bank with 900 pound, credit sales has control with 900 pound because they then don't owe you that 900 pound. But at this point in time, the sales ledger control is still saying that person still owes me 100 pound and they're not gonna pay you because you've let them off that amount. So what you would do is debit discounts allowed because that's gonna offset the credit of sales. And then the credit will go to sales ledger control and reduce the asset of them owing you that last hundred pound because I don't know, pay you it again. Cool. Right, moving on, returns. So sales returns affect the um, sales ledger control account. I'm not quite sure we wrote this. Um, yeah, with sales returns, they obviously affect the sales ledger control account. And the way they look, it's effectively a bit like a discount. But instead of like you saying discount, it's them sending something back it's either not good enough they didn't want it uh it's broken whatever whatever you don't really need to know why but all you know is they've returned the goods and the double entry would be we would debit the um sales returns account and then credit sales ledger control to show that they don't owe us that amount of money now you might just say why don't we just debit sales um, and that's a good question. Um, the reason why we don't just debit sales is we want to, A, reflect the fact we have actually made a sale. But more importantly, if we just debited sales, it would just reduce sales and it would just get lost amongst all the other sales. If we debit sales returns, what that means is we can see if there are lots of people returning goods and it will highlight if there's a problem. Whereas if it just went debit sales, it just get lost. Really? Um, same with purchase returns. If you send something back, uh, it's going to uh, reduce the amount of money you owe. So you debit purchase ledger control and then you credit purchase returns and the credit of purchase returns would offset the uh, cost of the debit in purchases. And again, you wouldn't just credit purchases because although you would net them off in the actual accounts, you keep them separate because you'd want to highlight if you're sending a lot of goods 
back and it might make you think well what's the purchase the manager doing if the buying all the stuff that needs going back so just keeping it in those two separate accounts um sort of highlights if we are having higher than expected issues with returns cool so moving on last one now we think about the trial balance here and we're not looking at you know what is the entry that these would be in the sales ledger controller accounts or anything like that but what is the actual account of each of these would it appear as the debit or credit on the trial balance so thinking about what i've just said sales returns do we think these are a debit or a credit debit this is very conclusive um <laughs> yeah you're all right it would be a debit because of that offsets the so what you well, actually when you do the accounts you do actually net them off but in the counting records you do keep separate accounts um so you can highlight if you've had lots of returns because something's going wrong so it would be a debit because it offsets the credit in sales and conversely purchase returns what do you think they are oh everyone's on the ball with this um that's right everyone's right it would be a credit because it offsets the debit of purchases cool Moving on. Discounts allowed. I won't give any prompts. What do we think discounts allowed would be? A debit or a credit? Debit. Everyone's, getting on, everyone's on fire tonight. Exactly right. It would be a debit because this is a discount we're allowing our customers to have. Therefore, it offsets um, the credit of sales. So that's fine. Discounts received. What do we think? everyone's on the ball there it would be a credit because it offsets the cost of the purchases so they've actually wanted to get a bit discount what we originally bought is a little bit cheaper so we reduce the expense of the debit of purchases now two accounts we've not actually talked about uh, i won't prompt you that owing to hmrc what do we think that would be We've got a few answers here. Um, yes, the vast majority of you, all right, it would actually be a credit because it's VAT owing to HMRC. It is money that you are going to have to pay HMRC in the future. So it is a liability and as such a credit. So by well, the law of average, what do we think VAT owing Anyone other than anyone other than Elizabeth want to have a good guess at this? What do we think VAT owing from HMRC is? Debit. That's right. It would be a debit because it's an asset. HMRC owe the business money and they're going to get money in the future. So mostly when you are you know, working in accountancy, you will you'll do trial balances. And most businesses have will always have VAT owing to HMRC because the VAT that they owe on their sales is greater than the VAT they reclaim on their purchases because sales are greater than purchases and they're making money. However, do not assume that, HMR, that the VAT account will always be a credit. So in the exam, it could be either or, probably 50 50 chance, but in reality, you might find that some businesses, and you know, go back to my roots, farming, Farmers make sales that don't have any VAT on them. Milk, animals, wheat. Uh, so they don't make, they don't, they don't have any VAT they owe to HMRC, but they buy lots of stuff with VAT on. So they might claim the VAT back. Conversely, you might normally be paying to HMRC because your sales are greater than your purchases, but then one month, whatever reason, you buy a massive piece of machinery with loads of VAT on it and you claim that back. So, that's getting more into level three kind of stuff. But in your exam, do not assume that uh, HMRC is always a credit. Likewise with the bank. I see lots of students who assume that the bank's always a debit. It can easily be a credit because they're overdrawn. So don't worry about that. Cool. Anyone got any questions on anything so far? Cool. Um, I know it's only going meant to be done for half an hour, but I've got five minutes. Uh, I'm not going to pay too late. So do you want to go through uh, another question I've got prepped? Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so this is a trial balance. You will have to do a trial balance in your exam. So what we'll do, we'll quickly just run through this and say whether we think it's a debit or credit and the reason why. So um, this is the cutoff point between bookkeeping and accountancy. So bookkeeping, traditionally, you produce a trial balance and you stop. And then the accountant picks it up, does some accounting adjustments and prepares a set of accounts. Uh, that's traditionally the historic split between bookkeeper and accountant. It's a bit merged nowadays, um, but it's also split between level two and three. So in booking transactions, you'll prepare an, a trial balance. In booking controls, you'll prepare a trial balance, you might have to adjust it, but you'll stop. In level three, advanced bookkeeping, you will take that trial balance and turn it into a set of accounts, which is far more interesting rather than a list of numbers. It shows what you owe and what you are owed. Cool. So let's have a quick run down here and let's see what we all think they are. So machinery, do we think that's a debit or a credit? That's right. It would be a debit because it's something that's worth something to you. You can either make money from it. Uh, you can sell it. Um, hopefully this time next year, it's still here. It's worth something. So it's, it is an asset. What about inventory? Debit. Damn it. Exactly. It is goods. You've got it stuff. It might be raw materials. It might be finished goods. Either way, you can either use it to make new goods or you can sell it and you'll get more money. So it's an asset. You're going to get some money in the future. Now, the bank here, we've not been told. So we're going to leave the bank because um, it can either be a debit or a credit. And that will be the balancing figure. So moving on, petty cash control. We've not been told whether it's a debit or a credit or it's overdrawn or anything, but we know with petty cash, because there's, there's we're over petty cash, you've either got money or you haven't. You can't go overdrawn with petty cash tin. It's like your piggy bank. Uh, it's either got money in or it's empty. It's never other than IU. So petty cash will always be a debit. So let's control. What do you think? Debit or credit? Debit. That's right, because this shows what our customers owe us and all things being well, they will pay us. Uh, and we'll have, we'll have some money, so it's an asset. Uh, purchase ledger control. What do we think that will be? We've got a few mixed answers on this one. Credit. Okay. Purchase ledger control is a liability. It shows what we owe our suppliers. So we're going to, have to pay some money out. So it's going to be a credit. Next one, VAT owing from HMRC. You can remember what this was. Emphasis Debit. on from. Debit. That's right, so it is an asset. HMRC owe the business money, so that's going to be a debit. Next one, capital. Reverse, odd one. Credit. That's right. So capital is, is a bit like a liability because it's money the business owes to the business owner. But we don't show it as a loan or anything like that because a like the bank, they always get their money. So if they, if this bank want their money, they will make you sell stuff. Uh, a reduced price just to get some cash in. They will potentially make you bankrupt. They'll make you sell your home and things like that, make you sell your car uh, to pay their debt. The bank will do anything to make sure they don't come off worse. Whereas the business owner, if they are owed money from the business, let's be honest, they're not going to start suing the business. They're not going to start making the business sell stuff for less than it's worth just to get some cash in because it's their livelihood. So we show it as capital as a separate transaction because although oh, it is money owed to the business owner, it is way more safer the business owes money to the business owner than owes money to the bank. Um, speaking of which, that was a nice segue, loan from the bank, what do we think that is? Credit. That's right. So we owe money to the bank account, uh, to the bank. We're going to have to pay them, unfortunately. Um, moving on, sales. Credit. That's right. Sales under, I, I like dead click, um, income, it is a credit. And then conversely, what do you think sales returns? Debit. Debit. Right. It's going to be a debit because the, this figure here offsets the credit of that and comes to our, like, oh, I don't know, was it 175,000? But we want to show that actually is four and a half thousand pounds worth of returns reasonable? No idea. But we look at historic trends, but we just keep it separately and one would offset the other. So purchases, what do you think they are? Debit or credit? Debit. That's right because uh, it's an expense. And then on that side, purchase returns would offset them, so they're going to be a credit. Now, moving on to the discounts. Remember my rule about discounts, who's in charge? What do we think discounts received relate to? Credit. Yep, 
credit, you're right, because discounts received are discounts we receive from our suppliers. Therefore, it's going to offset the debit of our purchases come to the true underlying cost of what our purchases cost us. Whereas discounts allowed, what do we think, debit or credit? Debit. That's right. So that discounts allowed is that uh, discounts we're allowing our customers to have. So it offsets our sales because it's effectively a bit we're letting them off. So it's going to be the debit to offset the credit of sales. Now, the next ones are all expenses. So I won't go through in, in turn, but expenses are a debit. So we can just tick them off because you'll find there's a lot more always on the debit side than um, there is on the credit side. So if your trial balance doesn't balance, um, look at the credit side first because it's just less transactions and re add. Re so check that everything on the credit side, you're happy it should be there. And then also uh, check you've added up the credit side correctly. And if that's not it, look at the debit side, unfortunately, because uh, that will save you time in the exam rather than looking at the debit side. And as a slight aside, if your trial balance doesn't balance, get the two totals and divide it, the, the difference by two. So say you had a balance of 9,000 there and you had a figure of 10,000 there. Obviously it doesn't balance. You've got a difference of a thousand pounds. So what you would do cross that out, make that 500, um, is you'd get the difference, 1,000, divide it by two, and then look for something of that amount. So if we've got a difference of 1,000, divide it by two gives us 500, we'd think, have we got a transaction of 500 pound? And if we have, we'd look at it like hotel expenses. That's on the credit side. And you think, actually, should that be right? And you think, actually, no, that should be on the debit side. So you can see how what's happened here. So instead of the both balancing off at 9,500, the debit side is actually actually missing 500 so that's gone to 9,000 and the credit size should be nine and a half is actually 10. So we can cross that out, put that back on the side that it should be and then these will balance both off at 9,500 pound. That trick only works if you've got one entry on the wrong side. If you've got more than one entry on the wrong side it won't work but that's the first thing I would do. Check your credit side, check your addition, check the debit side and then if you've got a difference Divide it by two and look for that amount. And if you can find that amount, that's great. If not, you have to do pick it out. However, look how many totals there are on here. There's loads. Um, you can have one figure wrong and your trial balance won't balance. You're not there to get your trial balance to balance. So don't start putting stuff on the wrong side that you know is wrong to get your trial balance to balance. You're there to get uh, a pass in your exam. So if it doesn't balance, obviously there's an error, but you can still have 19 out of 20 figures correct and do really well on the exam. So don't start changing stuff until you, unless you know that it's wrong. If you know it's right, don't change it, just to balance off your account. Uh, that's not what we're looking for, we're looking to pass the exam. Cool, has anyone got any questions or anything that we've covered so far uh, this evening? Cool. Um, brilliant, so um, good luck to everyone who's got an exam coming up soon. Um, just while I've got to be remiss of me to say, don't forget we've got 25% off our AAT online courses. Um, don't forget we are AAT's Distance Learning Provider of the Year, PQ Magazine Online College of the Year, AT2 of the Year, that's not really relevant, that's just me. Uh, and don't forget we've got our £15 mock package. If you want any questions or um, extra mocks, something like that, we've got our £15 mock bank. Um, yeah, Caroline, what happens to the bank? What we do is you would add up the totals on your trial balance and then you would see there's a difference. And the bank, all things being well, would be the balancing figure for purposes of expediency. Uh, I haven't done that. But the, the reason why we do that is um, we don't want people to get the question right just by playing with the numbers and getting to balance. It's more, can you get it right kind of thing. And we know that. Uh, but yeah, that's good feedback. Mock bank, that's very useful. Cool. Right, I'll be sending out the recording. Don't forget, we've got uh, revision sessions for Elements of Costing is on a Tuesday night. Um, and then we've got all the other units, level three and four as well. Cool. Um, someone will be here. I don't know who's down for next week. Anyone got any preferences about what we cover next week? I'm open to suggestions.